This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, latest monthly virtual student chapter webinar. Uh, we're very excited to provide another great program for you. Before we begin, I just wanted to uh, send out an announcement to the attendees. My name is Eddie Gonzalez. I'm the program manager that uh, has the pleasure of working with our college outreach and our virtual student chapter efforts. Uh, I did want to highlight for any students and faculty that are on the call that is part of our annual meeting, uh, JETC. This year, we are planning a, a two sessions devoted to our student members. Um, so if you're uh, registering for the conference, student registration is free to attend our annual conference. Uh, it's a conference that has a lot of technical sessions. Uh, we have a whole track on leadership sessions, and then we have an expo where a lot of our member companies will be there, you know, talking about their business. So it's a good chance to get to know them and uh, ask them questions about hiring or internships or uh, anything that might interest you about their work if you uh, want to research any of these companies. Uh, to help uh, everybody uh, get a better experience, we do have two events that we're planning with our young professional uh, community of interest. These are SME members that are under 39 years of age, so they represent that uh, uh, the group that most of our students would graduate into. Uh, we are planning an orientation on the Friday before the conference from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, that will be on the conference platform, so we'll get to show everybody how the virtual conference platform is organized uh, that, uh, uh, that you'll use to access the technical sessions. Uh, and then we'll do a little orientation to the expo hall. And we'll also have a panel of young professionals uh, that will be giving you their perspectives of uh, how to get the most out of the conference. So if you've never been to our annual meeting, it's a great experience. It's a little different virtually, but all of this is hopefully leading to a nice student uh, program that we can have at next year's annual meeting, which I believe is in, oh, I'll have to check, uh, Denver maybe? But, um, and then on Monday, uh, the day before the conference begins, we're gonna have a reception, a virtual reception with our young professional COI. They've got, uh, uh, and the college outreach COI are planning a little uh, game for everybody to play just to get to know each other. Um, again, it, that one will be on this platform. So you'll get a chance to interact with each other uh, on camera. So be on the lookout for that. Students, you should have received a notice with the instructions and registration link. Uh, again, registration to our annual meeting is free. Uh, so feel free to check that out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea Clapsaddle. She is the chair of the virtual student chapter uh, who will introduce our speaker and get us uh, get the formal program started. Take it away, Andrea. All right, thank you, Eddie. Yes, this is Andra Clapsaddle. Uh, welcome everyone. Good to see uh, everybody who's joining us here today. So uh, for some of you may be aware, we just wrapped up a three, three webinar series on uh, some, some educational things for you. So I wanted to kind of change our flow and invite uh, someone who I think has a very interesting engineering background. So to give you a kind of an idea of what the opportunities are out there as an engineering student. So so I invited Tony to join us and he was more than uh, welcoming to us to make time in his schedule today because I know he's very busy right now. So uh, just a little bit of background, Tony and I served together in the Air Force, both Air Force civil engineers and that's of course where we met. Uh, but since he retired, uh, Tony had has had a couple of what I think are, are pretty cool jobs and one of them was working for United Airlines uh, managing their real property and facilities in their southwest region. And now he works uh, as vice president of attraction development for Universal Studios. So just uh, asked him to come on here today and speak to you guys about what his uh, career path has been like and give you some tips on uh, on how to look at engineering and, and as you come up to graduation. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Tony. Thank you, Tony. Awesome. First of all, can you guys see the screen that I'm trying to display? I'm getting some. We're seeing your team screen, not the presentation, Tony. All right. Hold on a sec.
There we go. Much better. All right. And confirm you're seeing just the single single uh, title page. Perfect. All right. So a um, little bit of uh, rules of etiquette as we go along. If you guys have got questions, I don't mind you asking them through the uh, through the presentation, but just throw a question mark up in the, uh, the chat room. Um, you know, I'm going to probably go through this pretty quick. Um, I've lived this, so uh, it's, you know, pretty, pretty uh, <laughs> ingrained in me, but there might be some questions. Um, what you'll see throughout a lot of this is that, um, you know, there's been some um, really good luck. There has been some really good decisions. There's probably been some bad decisions, but I'm not going to get into those today. Um, and just some, you know, some lessons learned and some some really some really good times throughout the Air Force time. So without further ado, we'll we'll get going uh, through here. Again, if you got questions, throw a question mark up in the chat. Okay, uh, this is with the overview. Um, so I'll get into my background before my careers. Um, we'll talk about the three careers, if you will, the Air Force uh, being the longest, obviously, with 26 years served. Um, United Airlines, and then my time here at uh, Universal Creative, which is is pretty interesting. And from that, we'll take away some lessons learned, and then we'll open it up uh, to, to more questions if you'd like. So a little bit about my background. Um, I was born in 1967 in Lafayette, Indiana, and you know, several of you are probably shaking your head, going, "Man, this dude is old." But you know, I'm young at heart, so we'll take it at that. Uh, my dad worked construction. That's kind of where I got into. Um, the, the field I'm in. My mom was an x-ray tech. Um, I graduated high school in 1986. I played football, ran track, you know, standard uh, high school fun. Um, I was commissioned uh, in the Air Force through uh, ROTC at Purdue University. So uh, any boilers out there? Um, let's hear a boiler up, hammer down if you can do that. Oh, bummer. Okay. So um, graduated with a uh, BS in civil engineering. Um, one of the things um, I, I do like to tell people is I didn't start in civil engineering. I actually started in aeronautical engineering. Uh, when I got my my uh, pilot training slot with ROTC, I had a real um, tough choice to make, and that was to either go to an aviation technology uh, degree or to you know not throw away my engineering background because I'd already done three semesters in engineering. Um, I talked to a friend of mine's father who was a professor in civil engineering. He said, yeah, don't waste that. Come over to CE for a, for a semester and let me know what you think. Um, I got over to civil engineering and absolutely loved it. So um, you'll see that, as, you know, is one of the main choices in, in my life that has helped out in the past. Because um, you can see I headed to uh, undergraduate pilot training after ROTC, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I, got a, I have a graduate degree from the University of Illinois in uh, geotech, uh, civil engineering. So uh, any Illini out there? No Illini. Bummer. Okay. So no boilers, no Illini, so I'm alone and unafraid. Okay. So hobbies. Um, fitness. Uh, Jeeps. I've got a, an, an old Jeep that I like to tinker with. Harleys. I've uh, ridden motorcycles for a, uh, a, a very long time. Um, I'm really into anything that turns fuel into noise and speed. Um, so cars, um, airplanes, racing, whatever. Um, ham radio operator, ham radio extra operator. Um, I'm also into home brewing and distilling, and then also into scuba diving. Um, people always ask me my favorite sport teams, and, and for, for football and, and baseball, it's the Bears and the Cubs, and then anyone who's playing the uh, New England Patriots or the New York Yankees. So um, those are all four of my teams. All right, let's get into a little bit about my uh, Air Force career. And like I said earlier, that uh, spans from 1990 to uh, 2017 when I retired. Um, I was a career civil engineer with the exception of my first assignment, and we'll go through those here in a second. But you know, for those of you that are studying civil engineering or any of the, um, the disciplines below, so that's architects, uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, industrials, civil and environmental engineers, um, you can come into this career field in the Air Force. And what we do is, uh, you know, we sustain the facilities. Any, any place there's an Air Force or now Space Force operation going, um, we can take care of the facilities, we take care of the emergency management, we take care of the EOD, the fire department, um, and all of the, um, the support services when it comes to facilities. 
Uh, we do design project planning, programming, and managing and maintenance of the workforce um, and the military uh, folks as well. In addition to that, um, if you're military in most Air Force bases, you'll be part of uh, what's called a prime beef team. Beef is uh, the base engineer emergency force. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, that later. Okay, here's where I've been assigned. You can see it's all over the globe, uh, mainly in the uh, Southern United States, although I've had a couple of stints up in the Pacific Northwest and then the Midwest. And then I've been assigned over in Aviano and Guam. Let's dig into those just a little bit. Um, so you'll see uh, from November of 91 to March of 92, I was a student at undergraduate pilot training. Uh, when I arrived there, I went and did what every student in UPT does and went and had a uh, entry into uh, pilot training physical. What they found then was a problem with my eye. So I was medically disqualified. So um, you can see that choice that I made early on in my college career set me up for success going forward in the military because I had a backdrop. You know, if I didn't study and, and motivate myself to, to stay a civil engineer, I wouldn't have been able to, to follow the path I eventually did. Um, I left Reese uh, Air Force Base, Texas, kind of dejected, um, moved over to uh, Homestead Air Force Base, um, trying to figure out what the civil engineer career field was. Um, there I was the deputy chief of construction management, so I did um, just what it says. I managed the construction in and around base, uh, did a couple of small jobs on my own, um, I assisted others doing some larger jobs up until the point in August of 1992 when Hurricane Andrew came and blew me out the front door of Homestead Air Force Base. So within a little over a year, I um, ended up moving uh, three times to pilot training from Reese to Homestead and then from Homestead down to Davis Monthan. Davis Monthan is when I entered and did my first full. Um, stint at a, at a base. There, um, I did what, what many uh, second lieutenants will do. We moved around a lot, trying to learn what the career field is, trying to get a lot of experience that will uh, inform us going forward. There, I was the chief of SABRE, uh, which SABRE is the Simplified Acquisition of Base Engineering Requirements. What that is, is a, uh, is a, cost, a fixed cost contract where you adjust the quantities of materials drywall, say whatever it is, to do construction projects, small scale generally, um, but that's what Sabre is. Environmental engineering, uh, I was the wastewater um, uh, program manager at Davis Monthan for the time I did that. And then eventually I, I became a flight commander there and I was the uh, chief of the readiness flight. From there, I moved to uh, Aviano Air Base. That was right before the Bosnia operations happened. So um, right in the thick of things, um, I was in Aviano as the civil engineer regional readiness officer um, for 16th Air Force that at the time 16th Air Force oversaw all of the um, Southern European region of USAFE. So traveling around Southern Europe, um, I had to tell you that that, uh, that, that assignment was, was, was not awful. Um, it was pretty cool. Um, did well enough there or poor enough there, I don't know how you how you look at it, the Air Force didn't think I was smart enough, so they had to send me back to school. That's when I went back to the University of Illinois and through an AFIT program, got my master's degree that I mentioned earlier. From there, um, what the Air Force does is they'll take those AFIT students and they'll put them into positions um, where they can use, utilize those degrees to um, better the Air Force. I was selected out of, uh, out of U of I to become the uh, chief of the pavement evaluation section at then the headquarters Air Force Civil Engineer Support Agency, which is now AFCEC Detachment 1 at Tyndall Air Force Base. And you can see the timing there. I landed there right before 9-11. Uh, um, we'll get into more about uh, how that affected me um, a little later on, but I just wanted to point out that timeline. After the, the uh, AFE team, I uh, was selected to be the commander of the operations flight at the 56th CE Squadron out at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. There I led all of the in-house uh, labor that maintains and operates a base. Um, after Luke, um, this is kind of where my, uh, my uh, career in the Air Force um, stepped away from what people would consider the norm 
Um, I was asked to go to a MagCom uh, staff to go do some work on a, on a MagCom staff. I opted since, um, you know, 9-11 had happened and we had just gone through uh, operations in Iraq. Um, I felt the work still needed to be done. So I opted to become the uh, deputy commander of the 823rd Red Horse Squadron in Herbert Field, Florida. Um, we'll get into my deployments in a little bit, but um, at that assignment, I was at that uh, base for seven days and deployed for the first time um, out of uh, uh, the 23rd, um, out of two times in two years. So um, good, good, uh, good experience. And we'll get into that a little bit later. After that assignment, I was selected to uh, my first command. Um, as I was, we were discussing earlier, I was selected to command the uh, 554 Red Horse Squadron at uh, Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. Um, just to note, uh, this is the first time um, the, the squadron there was selected to be the 2009 Curtin Award winner. Um, the first time that a Red Horse Squadron had been selected, and if, I, if I've been tracking it uh, correctly, that's the uh, only time a Red Horse Squadron had been selected to, to be the Curtin Award winner. So needless to say, I had a, a lot of great folks um, out there uh, working to, to make um, the squadron look good, make me look good, because you know I couldn't have done that on my own. From there, I was selected to uh, go to the Pentagon. I worked in the SAF IEI office, uh, the Director of Installation Management. Um, I did a lot of uh, uh, housing privatization and um, uh, other stuff. I was the lowest ranking person in the office coming out of squadron command. So what that means is I did everything nobody else wanted to do. Um, I guess I did okay at it because I was selected after that to become a, a student at Air War College at Air, Air University. So I went out there for a year and you know the Air Force decided I wasn't smart enough again. So they wanted to make try to make me smarter, smarter than I was before. So out of there, um, I was uh, selected uh, to be the commander of the 820th Red Horse Squadron. Interesting uh, note, my commander at the 56th CE Squadron, the wing commander there was actually the commander at 12th Air Force at the time. Um, so that's why I was selected to be the 820th Red Horse Squadron commander. Um, so it, it pays to, to do good at previous jobs to get selected for your next job. So um, good, good uh, choice doing good out at, the, at Luke to get selected to go to Nellis. After that, um, I was only there a year, unfortunately, um, but I was selected for group command. Um, so, uh, but this group command was a little bit different. At the time, uh, the DOD had 12 joint bases. Um, one of them was Joint Base Lewis McCord. I was selected to be the deputy commander of the Joint Base Lewis McCord and dual hatted as the commander of the 627th Air Base Group um, out at uh, uh, JBLM Washington. And then finally, um, I went to be the director of readiness at uh, the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. Um, what that did is it oversaw all of the um, OT&E for uh, uh, Red Horse Prime Beef, um, oversaw EOD, emergency management, the fire department, um, all of the uh, wartime uh, materials that CE uh, supports, um, really culminated all of my experience through my career um, to provide oversight at that directorate. So that's my official assignments through the Air Force, but that's only part of the story. So where else did I do work? Well, here's a good picture of uh, all the places that I've done um, work throughout my, my uh, Air Force career. One thing that I'll point out, um, it's pretty cool, and I, I'm glad I had the opportunity, opportunity to do it, is I was able to go work on every continent there is. You'll see the star down on, on Antarctica. Um, pretty cool story. I went down there to evaluate um, compacted snow runways. So we went down there, did the evaluation, and lo and behold, the first time a, uh, a C-17 came down to Antarctica um, was when I was down there doing the evaluation. So good stuff. A lot of great experience in these stars. Um, you'll see that, uh, you know, I, like I said, I've been to all seven continents. I've uh, deployed nine times. My first one is a first lieutenant to El Salvador. I took a team down there to build a base camp for the Army. Um, like I mentioned in Aviano. Um, I deployed uh, two weeks after arriving at Aviano to open up Tuzla Air Base for the Operation Joint Endeavor. And then with the Airfield Pavements Evaluation Team with a, um, an Army-tasked jet team at Luke 
And then with uh, Red Horse, I did uh, seven deployments to Southwest Asia. And there's some cool pictures of all those fun experiences there. A couple of assignments I kind of want to touch on because they're probably the most engineering uh, intense assignments I had. Um, the first one being the airfield pavements evaluation team. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we manage uh, contractors doing construction or do con construction management. Um, the next two assignments that I'm going to talk about, you are actually the engineer uh, doing the, the design or evaluation yourself um, or in the next one, as you'll see, doing the construction yourself. Um, these are absolutely not the only areas that you'll be able to do that, but definitely um, throughout my career, this is where I absolutely use my engineering degree to its fullest. So the airfield pavement evaluation uh, team uh, goes around the world evaluation, evaluating runways. Um, and right after 9-11, the team and I uh, had were going around and we had been to every place that the Air Force was operating uh, aircraft in the Southwest uh, Asia theater of operations. So um, a lot of travel, a lot of work, um, but a lot of great experience. And it really felt awesome at that point to be at the tip of the spear. Um, there was a point where I was, uh, we were stuck with airlift, um, trying to get to a location um, to do an evaluation. It was holding up one of the operations, being able to get in there. Um, the four-star AMC commander at the time said, okay, send them an airplane. They sent us an airplane. Um, lo and behold, they hauled us up to Northern Iraq and uh, we evaluated the airfield and the operations continued. Um, the photo in the bottom um, has been shown around the Air Force quite a bit. Uh, I've, I've seen it in several briefings. Um, it was really cool that I was actually on the, on the runway when they took that just on the other side of that uh, concrete mobile batch plant. Um, but really awesome experience uh, with the airfield pavements evaluation team at a time when the, the nation really needed, uh, needed me to be able to do that, that, that engineering and have that capability. The second one is Red Horse. Um, for those that have heard about Red Horse may not, under, may not know that that's an acronym. Um, so Rapid Engineer Deployable Heavy Operations Repair Squadron Engineer. That's why it's uh, written all capitalized. What that is, is it's the heavy construction unit for the Air Force. Um, for those folks in the DOD that don't know what Red Horse is, I often tell them it's like the Navy Seabees, only better. Um, so what a great, um, what a great experience um, going, going through that. Um, that's the 820th Red Horse Squadron um, you'll see in the picture over there and, and just a great experience. Again, um, this is where you really put the, the, the tracks meet the dirt, if you will, uh, when it comes to learning construction methods um, and, and actually physically doing them with the airmen. Um, the cool thing is uh, recent, uh, recent deployments. Um, the Red Horse teams have been augmented by military engineers um, from Prime Beef and other areas. Um, so Red Horse uh, wearing the red hat isn't exclusive to the Red Horse squadrons. It is exclusive to um, Red Horse members that, that uh, deploy um, out there. So good stuff. Um, so for 26 years, you'll see uh, young Second Lieutenant David on the left and then retiring Colonel David on the right. Um, it was a great run. Um, and one of the things that I, I wanna kind of point out is, you know, the 26 years in the Air Force gave me a skill set that made me very, very marketable once I retired. Um, you know, a lot of when, what I found when I retired is, you know, people were hungry for for civil engineers and engineers skill sets, especially the military. They were looking for people who were mission oriented, had a focus, knew how to get the job done and knew how to work in teams. So, um, you know, those are those are valuable assets that you carry out. Um, so as you know, if you, if you come into the military, whether you stay four years or 26 or 30, um, understand that you're gaining valuable assets just by being a military member that you may not, you may not know. So let's look into a little bit about my time at United Airlines. So, um, I transitioned out of the Air Force, you know, in the Red Horse units, I was building things around airplanes. I was thinking to myself, well, you know, that's kind of the same. I'd be building stuff around airplanes. Um, 
well, military aircraft and uh, airlines are, are very different. You know, I, I have yet to find a, a airline club at an Air Force base. Um, you know, you don't go in and have a couple beverages before you get on a flight in the Air Force. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, experiences and, and skill set that I, that I brought out of the Air Force was directly applicable. So what did I do for United Airlines? So as Andrew was saying, I was the uh, director of the South region. Um, that region is the one highlighted in blue. So I oversaw all of con all the construction um, in that region. That included uh, the hubs in Houston at uh, Bush Intercontinental and then Denver, and then every uh, line station in that area as well. So about 85 um, stations throughout there, um, we used to turn about 120 projects a, uh, a year. Um, that ranged anywhere from, you know, small renovations of break rooms all the way up to multi-million dollar hangar programs. Um, in addition, we oversaw uh, terminal expansions at uh, Houston. There was the International Terminal Redevelopment Program. I was the United representative to that. Um, you know that that's a one billion dollar program that the Houston Airport Systems is is uh, is constructing, but they get imp input from all the airlines. In addition, Denver was going through a big expansion at that time as well, um, expanding both terminals uh, uh, A and B. Um, so we were coordinating directly with the uh, Denver International Airport Authority as well. Um, great experience, um, you know, doing that again. A uh, great transition from the military, building things around airplanes to building things around airplanes. Um, you know, one of the cool projects that I'll show next, um, this was one of the uh, big projects we had, the United Tech Ops Center, UTOC, we used to call it. Um, it was building that major hangar in addition to uh, converting a lot of the other areas and adjacent buildings into support facilities. This was a direct pick from my Air Force career. You know, there was a lot of planning and things like that that I learned how to do in the uh, military. In addition, we would build uh, hangar structures uh, very similar out in the Air Force. Understanding how aviation works, that's a direct lift from the Air Force. Um, you know, so this, this project I felt very comfortable with, um, you know, and it, it was a great transitional, transitional, um, uh, job coming out of the, out of the military. So from that, um, you know, I was I was content there, um, but you know, I was kind of getting the itch, um, you know, building things around airplanes and building things around airlines. Again, there's not as much adrenaline. You don't go on deployments. There's not a it 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 just was it wasn't as fun. So I was looking for some adrenaline. Um, that's when I uh, you know someone reached out to me and they say, Hey Tony, are you looking for uh, a new gig? How about you come look at, um, you know, Universal Studios? I was like, huh, I never thought about working in a theme park. Let's, you know, let's start talking about that. So um, came back a couple of times. They had, they had looked at me for a couple of positions that were laterals. Um, it was not quite in my skill set. And then they came up with the position uh, that I currently sit in, which is the vice president of attraction development. Um, and that's exactly what it is. I build the attractions. Um, I'm responsible for all the new attractions in um, the Orlando, uh, Universal Orlando Resort portfolio. So any new ride that's built within the three existing new parks, um, I oversee. That doesn't include the new park that they're building over at uh, Epic Universe. That's an entirely new um, project team um, that, that are building that. You'll see here in a minute the the pinnacle project that I'm working on um, as we go through that. All right. So how is uh, how is Universal Creative lined up with you know the parks lined up with NBC Universal and eventually lined up with Comcast? Well, Comcast is our parent company. Um, NBC Universal and and Universal Parks have have been handed around. Uh, quite a bit for um, a number of years. Um, used to be owned by GE. Um, it used to be owned by Seagram's a long time ago. Um, but now Comcast owns us. 
which proved to be pretty fortuitous um, going through the pandemic for the last year. So as the parks were shut down for a period of time, as a matter of fact, our uh, Universal um, Studios uh, Hollywood is still closed. Um, it's kind of counterbalanced that. So the diversity has really helped the, the business. So Comcast um, then falls into U NBC Universal, and that's all the NBC um, TV stations, Telemundo, and then Universal Pictures as well is over that. Underneath that is Universal Parks and Resorts, and then NB uh, Universal Creative falls into there. So the Universal Parks and Resorts oversees all of the Universal Parks around the world. Um, you'll see Universal Studios uh, uh, Orlando Resort, you'll see the Universal Studios Hollywood, Universal Studios Japan, Universal Studios Singapore, and the soon to be open Universal uh, Beijing Resort. Universal Creative is the development arm for all of those parks. So out of this, uh, out of this group, we do all of the resort development, all of the attraction development, all the new shows, everything that's built in the parks, uh, Universal Creative develops. Okay, like I said, um, Universal Creative does the uh, development around the globe. So what am I responsible for? Here's the parks that I'm, I'm responsible for. So the Universal or Orlando Resort is uh, Universal Studios Florida. It's also Universal's Islands of Adventure, which uh, was rated the number one theme park again last year. So woohoo! Um, Universal's Volcano Bay, which is the theme park, and then City Walk, which is the restaurants and uh, and shops out in the front. So let, let's talk a little bit about my um, my latest project, and I hope this plays. Let's see. Brave the hunt on a new species of coaster. Jurassic World Velocicoaster. The apex predator of coasters. Only at Universal Orlando Resort. The hunt is on, beginning June 10th. Pretty cool, right? So uh, here's the ride vehicle. Um, we're getting ready to open this, like the uh, video said, um, June, uh, June 10th. So if you all are down in the uh, Orlando area and you want to come ride the uh, soon to be best coaster in the world, uh, June 10th is your day. So come on down and check it out. Um, this is not like any other uh, construction project. Obviously, we're building it in the middle of a um, existing theme park. And I'll, I'll talk through this as I get the video rolling here. Here's a time lapse from about a year ago um, of us uh, constructing the uh, the the coaster in the middle of an operational theme park. So everything around there you see is, is all operational. We here have this little island in the center. What's that mean? That's a huge logistics challenge, construction challenge. Um, we have to look at different means and methods to, um, to do the development. Um, definitely uh, an interesting transition away from aviation. Um, challenging, absolutely. So um, as this, plays through, you can see it's kind of coming up out of the ground. Um, we had two points of, uh, of logistics. There was a, a point on the north and part, a point on the south, but we couldn't access those um, all the time when the park was operational. So we had to do what we call pulsing, which we had to stop the guests, go across a guest path, bring materials into the site and uh, build a construction. So, um, you know, challenging different ways of doing things. You know, uh, especially from an Air Force aviation guy, um, being crunched down into a small site like that was was an interesting challenge. Um, you know, I'm used to building things in wide open airfields and and things like that, um, but this absolutely was um, was a great a great job to be a part of, and um, it's turned out to be a resounding resounding success. So like I said, um, you know, lessons learned, um, take a lot of different skills uh, moving forward to, to do this, you know, and, and did I have any skills in building a roller coaster before I showed up at, uh, at Universal Creative? No, absolutely not. I would have never even thought about 
um, building roller coasters or attractions or anything. But I knew, um, and I was very confident in the skill set that I brought to the table. One of the things that uh, Universal Creative looks for um, in in positions here is, you know, leadership, ability to lead people, ability to make decisions. Um, the Air Force um, and you know my time at leading at United United Airlines as well gave me those skill sets. You know I was able to uh, leverage a lot of uh, um, construction skills that I had developed in Red Horse and in United Airlines. Um, you know both to transition here to um, to develop this as well. The cool thing about this is um, you know like I mentioned earlier my background um, and kind of my hobbies. I'm kind of a, a gearhead at heart. Um, it was really that really actually helped me as well because you know as you go through testing a what is in essence is a big machine, um, understanding the mechanics of it and understanding how things work and you know just bringing the engineer mindset to it really helped out um, building this. So, like I said earlier, if you're around um, Universal on the uh, 10th of June. Come on down and see me, and uh, we'll uh, we'll take you for a ride on the uh, the new Velocicoaster. So a couple things that you know I mentioned a, co a couple times uh, my other work, and I put work in air quotes because you know obviously I don't get paid for that, but it's it's still stuff I do. Um, I was recently um, elected and now sit on the council for the town of Windermere, which is my uh, where I currently reside. Um, and I hope to plant some roots. Um, so, you know, the town of Windermere serving them, um, it kind of, uh, that's one of the things that I, I was lacking when I uh, left the military. Obviously in the military, you, you have a sense of service. I didn't find that sense of service and serving others, serving the community, um, either at United nor at Universal. So, you know, I was looking for that. Serving on the town council of Windermere has given me that. So, you know, um it's it's really helped out uh hopefully we'll move forward on that and then uh, just staying in touch with the my military heritage and the legacy um i serve on the board of directors for the red horse and prime beef association and like we were talking beforehand um this is a good organization to get into if you like to you know tell war stories and and learn about the legacy of uh, air force engineers both in red horse and prime beef so let's let me talk a little bit. And I'm going to stay on this slide for a few minutes here about some of the lessons learned I've I've learned throughout my three careers, if you will. Um, one is don't limit your options. Obviously, that is, you know, very evident in my career path. You know, if I would have limited my option way back at Purdue by transitioning to what I considered an easy degree and not gone the harder route of becoming a civil engineer, I wouldn't have had uh, the career I had. You know, that really set the stage for my ability to, to do what I did, not only in the Air Force, but at United and, and Universal Creative. Um, you know, so don't limit yourself. In addition, if you're offered a position, you, you think, eh, I don't know what that's going to do for me, um, or I don't know if I want to do that, or, uh, you know, I, if you're hemming and hawing about it, do it. I mean, try it. Don't limit yourself. Expand your horizons. Um, the second one, always know how you can get better. Um, you know, in the Air Force, you don't have to get your professional engineer's license, but that's something I wanted to do, um, you know, professionally. So I did that. I'm a registered professional engineer in Indiana and Texas. Um, in addition, I've gone back and got my project management professional uh, registration, um, which was, you know, quite honestly, pretty easy once I applied all the knowledge I had gained in the Air Force going, going forward. You have all the skill set to get that. Why not get it? Once you get the uh, requisite hours, um, go ahead and apply for that. Take the test and show people that you have the skills and the tool set uh, to be a project management professional. Um, you know, I had mentioned my hobby, you know, I, I went in amateur radio um, from technician class all the way to amateur extra. Um, that's just a way that, you know, I, I consider myself a lifelong learner. I always wanna learn something new. I always wanna, you know, figure out how things work. 
Um, and that's just, you know, something that's helped me along the way. You can always add a tool to your toolbox. So find what that is. If it's something that'll help you either in school or in a hobby or whatever it can be, always know how you can better yourself. Um, the third one, know your job and do your job. You know, th this has been kind of a motto I've had since I was really young. Um, you know, if I didn't know my job, I'd learn it. You know, if I didn't know it, I would do it and learn it. So you, by knowing your job and learning your job and, and growing, um, you're absolutely going to better yourself going forward. Um, the next one, you know, I've seen people really struggle with this one. Um, bloom where you're planted. You know, I never, ever wanted to go to the Pentagon. Never wanted to go to the Pentagon. I never wanted to work housing privatization. You know, I never wanted to do a couple of the other assignments I was given. But when I did that, and I did the one above, and I did my job, and I worked hard at it, and I learned, and I did the very best I could every day, you know, I was recognized for that. As you can see, you know, when I left the Pentagon, I was selected for, um, I was selected for Air War College, you know, so that was obviously um, a sign that I had, I had done okay at the Pentagon, even though I wasn't really excited about the work I was doing. So definitely bloom where you're planted. This one is really applicable in the, uh, and, and you'll hear it a lot in the military, one team, one fight, uh, the, the, um, it usually represents the um, inter-service rivalries and joint operations. I like to use it because um, it reminds me to that you know you're on the same team. Collaborate. You know it's what what I've seen in the in the outside world uh, and the military. Quite honestly, is the teams that collaborate and work together um, are usually the most successful teams. Um, the reason I mentioned the Curtin Award for the 554th is, you know, quite honestly, that was probably the most collaborative, um, focused team that I led um, throughout my whole Air Force career. That's why we won that award. You know, it was, it was you know, what, truly one team, one fight. And the last one is, is kind of, you know, for me personally, um, You'll see a lot of folks going through the career and they get really off balance or either over they they are workaholics, they or they kind of go to the other extreme where they're, you know, they're introverts, they don't do well at work. You gotta find balance. And that's, you know, physical, mental, spiritual, um, within that. You can't be, you know, a one one dimensional person. Um, every person has got multiple dimensions. Um, make sure you you tend to all of them. Um, you know, finding balance will make you better um, throughout your thing, throughout your, your life. Um, I've, I've told people here who tend to, to work a lot, you know, take time, sharpen the ax. You know, you can cut a lot more trees down with a sharp ax versus just smacking a dull ax into, the, into a tree. So find time to balance yourself. Take time for yourself you know, while you're still growing and getting better, um, that will make you, you know, very successful uh, going forward. So with that, that's a, uh, just a quick run through of uh, my career, um, my life up to this point, um, you know, my transition from the Air Force to United Airlines to, to Universal Creative. Um, we could probably open it up now for, uh, for any questions. Okay. Tony, there was um, one question in the chat on uh, from Juan who wanted to know what you actually did in Colombia. So we went down to Colombia at the at the request of the 12th Air Force Commander at the time, and we were looking. Um, it was with the A20th Red Horse Squadron. We went down there and we evaluated an airfield um, that we were we were going to help the Colombian Air Force reconstruct. So you know we took a plane down to Bogota and then a C-130 out to another small thing. We jumped in trucks and went out to this other airfield that was pretty dilapidated um, and kind of set the stage um, for Red Horse and the Colombian Air Force to work together to reconstruct this, this airfield. It, great experience. I, I, to this day, love Colombia because of that trip. It's just beautiful down there. 
Um, you know, but a lot of it was, you know, aviation construction related. Um, so that's what I did when we went down to Columbia. I have one for you, Tony. Um, what was the most important thing, the most important tool that you gained from your, your undergraduate college uh, experience? Uh, so many of our uh, the listeners today are just uh, starting in college or getting ready or thinking about college. Uh, what advice would you give them? So, I, I'm not sure I learned um, about my undergrad until truly I made it to my graduate degree. And one of the things I'll, I'll mention to um, undergrads is you, you have acquired a, a tool set, you have acquired a skill, you've acquired knowledge. Don't leave that undergrad thinking that, that is, that's all there is to be learned. Um, several of my friends you know, walked out of there and said, well, I'm an engineer now, I know everything. Um, and I, it, it, quite honestly, I, I was one of them. I thought I, I've got a civil engineer degree, I'm a civil engineer. I didn't realize how wrong I was until I went to, to my graduate degree and learned more and then realized how much I didn't know. And then it truly came to light um, when I joined the airfield pavements evaluation team and started working with, you know, PhDs in the field, um, you know, and, and really gaining knowledge. Um, that's what set the stage, Homer, quite honestly, for, you know, my lifelong learning. You'll never stop learning. And if you think you know everything in the subject, you're, you, you've got a very, very um, narrow view of that. So, you know, always seek more knowledge. Um, don't think you know it all. Um, is probably what I learned about my undergraduate degree, albeit after my undergraduate degree. Good answer. What would you say is your most important life lesson that you learned from your military service? Um, always be agile. <laughs> I say this to this day. Um, a plan is something to deviate from. So, you know, in, in my life, I had a plan, especially when I was in my early days at Purdue. Well, throughout my days at Purdue, I was going to be an Air Force pilot. You know, I, I stuck it out in civil engineering because it was fun and I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, if, you know, my plan <laughs> was quickly deviated when I made it to Reese Air Force Base, and if I didn't have that fallback, I wouldn't have um, had a successful career as an Air Force civil engineer. I would have been, who knows what I would have done at that point, you know, but have a plan, um, but always understand that a plan is something to deviate from. And that's just a, you know, lesson in being agile. Something's gonna come your way. Always have um, a, an option. Always um, have a way to, um, capitalize on what you might think is a setback at the time. Um, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions that you don't see anything new in the chat? Are there any other questions out there? Quiet bunch. Yeah. Hey, Tony, this is Eddie. I have one about your, you know, especially with your time now in Universal, um, how often are you the the person representing kind of the technical side of decision making, and how often are you really having to pull your science background to kind of emphasize the need for a certain type of decision? So it's pretty interesting. So I um, the three areas that I that I oversee, and the three areas in in Universal Creative, there's the Creative Studio who kind of comes up with the ideas for the attractions. There's the Attraction Development Project Management Office, which I, I directly um, work for. And then there's Engineering and Safety. So um, as we go through uh, VelociCoaster being a good example, I've got a technical director that works for me. He is the engineering lead. Um, I help um, translate um, some of the issues he's having to senior leadership and kind of boil them down. Um, I'm not so much in the engineering realm Right now, I'm more in the, you know, obviously in the in the management role, but having the skill set and understanding of, you know, not only civil engineering uh, and some mechanical, 
um, helps me translate that. You know, try, if you bring the chairman of Universal Parks and Resorts out into uh, your job site, and he asks a question about, you know, why are you jamming those pipes in the ground? You have to be able to explain to him that those are driven piles, and that's how we get, you know, bearing capacity for the ride piers. Um, you know, so ha having that understanding and being able to do the translation for the senior members of, of Universal Parks and Resorts and the Universal Park um, really helps out a lot. Um, but a lot of times, you know, right now, Eddie, uh, I, I definitely don't sit down at the at the table and, and you know, do any designs. Um, I'm more of a translator. And that's where I that's where I come in. Make sure like I tell my folks, I, I knock hurdles out of the way for them right now. Awesome. Uh, have you ever been uh, faced with a, a, a situation, though, where either um, either from the military or from a business side where there's some overriding factor that you're having to balance against what you know about the technical piece, you know, <laughs> where all, you're the all, one translating the reality. All, all the time. So, you know, when, once you make it out of the military, all of a sudden um, cost and, and schedule comes into play, especially on a construction project. So you're always weighing, you know, a construction method with the cost associated with it, with the schedule impact. Um, you know, one of the reasons I was hired here at, at Universal Creative is because I understood the fact that, you know, schedule can be money. You know, opening an attraction early can get butts in the seats early, which will get people in the gates early, which, you know, that is a direct correlation. That schedule correlation directly impacts the overall bottom line of the company. Um, you know, so making those adjustments and understanding, you know, whether the engineering, um, needs to be so intense and so uh, redundant that it drives any of those other two um, is, is really a, a weight. And as you go through construction in the, in the outside sector, um, you know, in the private sector, and you know, both United and Universal Creative are, are in those sectors, you need to understand how those dollars and schedule and engineering um, redundancy factor in. You know, obviously we're building a safe attraction, but do we need factors of safety of three when a factor of safety of two would suffice? Um, so you need to understand that. And then as you, as you, as you discuss it with your, your project teams, you need to take those inputs and really boil them down and what's best for the company. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, we've got a couple of questions in the chat room here. As well as Don Gleason, who's probably the heckler you were looking forward to, to hearing from. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jessica Ruby uh, wanted to know what advice would you give students that were looking to pursue a career similar to the one you have with the Universal Studios. Um. So, uh, Jessica, just to clarify, your interest is in the engineering side of the house or creative side of the house? A little bit of both. So I'm going for mechanical engineering, so definitely engineering side, but I do have a creative side. So if there was a blend, that would be interesting. Yeah, so um, most of the engineering and safety folks um, are mechanicals. So um, that's that's a good start. Um, you know, mechanical systems is is that's all the ride is. So, you know, it's a combination of um, either gears or hydraulics or, you know, uh, electromagnetic, um, you know, all of the launch coasters we have are uh, linear synchronous motors. So an understanding of how those work and how the magnetics play into it. it it's really good that you have a little bit of a creative flair because uh, obviously, you know, a machine sitting on the ground by itself without all the, the, the creative storytelling wouldn't make an attraction for, for Universal Studios. Um, you know, uh, you see that in other areas where it's just a, you know, a coaster in the middle of a field. Um, we tend to uh, really lean on storytelling. Um, you know, so the VelociCoaster, uh, when you all come down and check it out, you'll see that there's a story uh, being told. Universal is, you know, at its, its very soul, a, a motion picture um, company. Um, so telling a story is integral to how we do things. So, you know, being able to understand how, um, mechanical gear systems work and understand how the um, creative side applies to that will will help you 
how you get in uh, into that. Um, we offer internships down here. Um, there's go on the Universal Creative webpage. There's uh, usually listed. I'm not sure if there's any coming up for this summer. Um, you know, obviously we're coming out of uh, uh, the pandemic, but we're we're getting back on our feet. Um, we did announce the relaunch of uh, the fourth park in Orlando, Epic Universe. So the opportunities will start increasing again. Uh, just keep an eye out for it. We're always looking for good interns. Um, you know, so um, and if you have any questions about that, shoot me a note or or you know, drop me a line. Thank you so much. Absolutely. John Gleason had a sort of follow-on question to that complimentary question. Yeah. So, Don, uh, uh, how did you get to UPT before they noticed the eye issue? I have no <laughs> idea. I went through four entry into pilot training physicals that they passed on, uh, you know, and I, I made it to Reese at UPT. Um, it was at the first um, physical as you walk in the door that they said, hey, Tony, um, your that left eye is just a little weak. Um, let's get you some glasses. Um, so they made glasses and at that time, you know, glasses didn't, it wasn't a one hour deal like it is today. So four weeks later, the Air Force handed me a set of glasses. I was driving home and I looked out the window of my uh, car and I saw a straight telephone pole out of my right eye. And then the other one had a, a small um, deformation in it. And I was like, ah, that's weird. So I, you know, not trusting um, the, the glasses that were made, I took them to a, a vision center and I said, okay, can you just check these glasses out? And lo and behold, the glasses were fine. They dilated my eye and they found it. So how they missed it in the four entry in the pilot training physicals before that, I have no idea, Don. You see, uh, Don's other uh, question about- Yeah, let me scroll down here. From the Air Force to Universal Steel. Yeah, so I I talk about this a lot. I try to help transitioning military, um, the folks that are they're coming out of the military into the civilian world um, a lot. I'm actually a mentor for the uh, uh, American Corporate Partners. Um, I get you know help folks coming through that program. My wife Mary Ann is uh, she's a, a uh, she works for Hiring Our Heroes, who does the same thing. What what lesson I will I'll tell you specifically. Um, for engineers coming out of the Air Force is you have a skill set that's desired. A lot of times I hear folks say, oh my God, what am I going to do when I come out? Um, and they instantly turn towards, um, you know, A&E firms working with the military because they think that's, you know, that's their comfort zone, but that definitely isn't what is applicable to their skill set. You know, um, I got picked up with, with United um, and then was, worked with them and and did very well you know before i transitioned over to universal creative you know i had an offer from united for a uh, a promotion i had an offer from a civil firm um to go run uh airfield redevelopment down in tucson and then i had the offer here at universal creative so you know transitioning out of the military don't think you have limited skill sets I mean, your technical skill set um, is may not be as strong as someone who has been doing it um, for 20 years on the outside. You have a much more broader general skill set that is equally as applicable. In addition to that, your leadership skills are far and away better than a lot of folks coming out of out of other industries. In addition, the teamwork, the mission orientation, you know, so. Um, the skill set that we bring um, out of the military is, is strong. And I think one of the lessons that I tell people um, transitioning is don't be afraid to talk about those. Um, you know, a, a lot of times in the military, we kind of, we kind of, you know, push that to the, to the, in your, the backside and don't talk about leadership. Don't talk about mission orientation. Don't talk about how you work with teams. You know, don't tell how you've led something. Um, and I think that's that's something that really needs to be enhanced because that's quite honestly a huge skill set and huge uh, set of tools in your toolbox that companies are absolutely looking for. Absolutely. So, you know, take advantage of that and make it known. We've got time for a couple more quick questions. Can you see those? Uh, uh, one um, from me and one from Adam Pitney. Pitney. 
Um, so Fozzie asks, um, what do you advise students if they have to decide if they want to stick with the general civil engineer track or construction engineering uh, management area of specialty? Um, I, I would concentrate more on the harder track. Um, what I found is the construction engineering management um, is something that you can learn. Um, a lot of times uh, the technical skills, it's harder to pick up. But what I would what I would also say is why not take coursework in both? Um, you know, take takes uh, the civil engineering track, learn the, the the standard structures or geotech, and take a couple of classes in construction management. It doesn't hurt. Again, don't close doors on yourself. Um, you know, so if you've got to take an extra class, um, you know, over over uh, uh, we used to call them May Mesters in, at Purdue or summer class, do that. Um, you know, because it only um, makes your skill set that much stronger. Let's see. Adam has a question for you too. Let's see, Adam. It says for an it's organization uh, such as Universal Studios, we have to advise someone hoping to work there in the future. Is utilizing a job search site a viable option? Is there opening? Yeah, there. So for Universal specifically, we advertise every position that's open. Um, so go to uh, just Google Universal Creative um, Careers and it'll come up and you can you can uh, look through yourself. Again, we advertise all of them. We don't we don't post any uh, we don't uh, uh, direct hire without posting anyone. Um, the one exception is uh, you probably have heard we've gone through a big furlough as of late. Um, so we are hiring a couple of those folks back into their prior positions with a technically what in, it ends up being a leave of absence. Um, let's see. Yeah, Tony, I think I, that's uh, we're hit the top of the hour. So I think that's about as much time as we had um, secured for the well, audience. Well, quick, Eddie. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, Andrew, did you have any closing comments? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank Tony for it was a great presentation. I think uh, judging by the amount of questions we got from and from our students as well, it's uh, I, I had a feeling it would be in, of interest. It's a unique position you've landed yourself in, but good to see how you've built your career to this point to get there. So, so thanks for your presentation. Thanks for oh, you asking, ready? Andrea. Yeah, thanks, and Eddie, thanks for uh, helping me get through all the first use on GoToMeeting. No problem. Uh, right. If there are any uh, student chapter representatives here that want a replay, I will be making the recording and the slides available on the college outreach or the virtual student chapter archive. So feel free to look that up. Uh, students, please remember to register for our annual conference so you can get clued into the events that we're planning there. Uh, and we'll be in touch about the next webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Right. Take care. Thanks, Tony. Thanks again, Tony. Bye.